Jackson is, and no doubt the rest of the team over there. And tonight, I think we should just start by seeing 12, verse 1, which is going to be up on the board. Larry's kindly put it up there for us, and Garrett's going to accompany us. Jarrett, sorry. <laughs> well, I think that's all he's got up there, one verse. Yeah. lead you in a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be gathered together again as your people this day. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to, to do this in peace and in freedom, that we can um, show a real interest in, in the spreading of the gospel, not just here in Launceston or Tasmania or Australia, but also in nations abroad. And we Think also of the work that's been done in Papua New Guinea and we thank you that there have been workers who have been busy in this field for many years and um, we have an opportunity to have some insights, first-hand insights into the work that's happening over there and we pray that also in this way we may uh, gain uh, some real knowledge and some understanding uh, for, for the work that's been done. And we... Indeed, thank you for the work that is done and we pray that your spirit will continue to work mightily in the hearts of those who do this work and also those who are participants in this work. And also as a congregation, um, we thank you that we have been given an opportunity also to support this work. And tonight uh, we pray that you will uh, bless us as we uh, share uh, some time together. Um, we also acknowledge that uh, Satan will still do his best to interrupt and to get in the way also this evening and we pray that you'll give us the strength also to resist him. Um, we pray that you will also uh, bless Mark as he uh, brings this presentation and we ask that you will um, give him also strength for this. We ask you this in the name of your son Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I'm not going to uh, stand up here and take up all your time because I've got a brother here that can do that. But for, for those who don't know him, it's Mark and Liz. They, they've actually um, made arrangements to come and visit our family, which is really nice. And then about a month ago he said, you know what, while I'm there I'm happy to do a presentation on the work we do. And of course we took up that offer and here he is. And thank you very much, Mark. But, uh, over to you. Just as a, a good evening, everybody, and again, thank you for uh, making your time available. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, 
or, or Liz. Um, just a, a quick introduction because I do do things a little bit differently. About 30 years ago, in fact exactly 30 years ago, I was involved in a very serious accident and spent a, a considerable time in hospital. Um, and one of the consequences of that burns was that my arms don't work too well. So my arms kind of are appendages to my body that, that kind of try to do their thing but don't always do it. So Liz has been an amazing wife for more than those 30 years, of course, but particularly in those last 30 years, taking very good care over me, doing buttons and flies and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm glad Colin doesn't do it. I'm happy enough for Liz to do it, that's for sure. Tonight, I would like to, uh, the focus is not on me, the, tonight the, the focus is on the work that we're doing in uh, uh, Port Moresby. And I'd like to focus on uh, the RCBC, the Reformed Churches Bible College. And we see the, the Reformed Churches Bible College as being a little bit of an, uh, an axis to the work that's happening. Um, it, it's central to the spreading of the Reformed faith in Papua New Guinea. We're very keen for the churches that are being established there to have national pastors and not white-skinned pastors. It's, it's hard enough to get um, pastors into churches in the West, let alone get them onto the mission field and um, lead churches there. So we need to have our national pastors doing that. And of course, they understand the culture. They understand the language um, and, and they can connect with their people way better than what any of our ministers, our white skin ministers, could possibly do. So uh, the Reformed Churches Bible College is central to that. Now, before I get to the Reformed Churches Bible College, I would like for you to be transported into Papua New Guinea. So we've landed in the plane, we've walked through this terminal, and it's all looking pretty neat. It's air conditioned. And then you open the door and you are confronted with about 30 degrees temperature and about 80% humidity. It's a wall of heat. And you might think, well, that's surely just one season. No, wrong. It's every day, non-stop. Um, and it just goes on and on and on, which is fine. You get used to that. As you uh, walk through the, the grounds of the airport, everything looks very neat and tidy. As you drive in the car and get to your first traffic light, you probably think, well, this is a really aggressive country. It is aggressive, but not that aggressive where there's um, blood being spilled. This is not blood. This is buai, betel nut juice. About 95% of the population chew buai. Whenever you stop at the traffic lights, the door opens and someone will go and spit out all of this buai and it is just everywhere. So get used to the red stains. That's what happens to their teeth when they've chewed it for long enough. We call it PNG lipstick. And markets their favourite item that people will sell at the markets is buai. It's those small little lemons. And on the right-hand side, you see what looks like a bean. That's a mustard stick. That's critical in chewing buai. And so is some calcium, crushed shells. And the combination of all three produces this red fluid. And it's highly addictive. They chew it from morning to night. It gives them a buzz, apparently. We've tried it, I've tried it once, and it will only ever be once. It was straight out of the mouth. It was just disgusting. It's obviously an acquired taste. And um, apparently it keeps them going. So you'll see plenty of buai everywhere. You'll see plenty of markets. This is their markets, just umbrellas. They just set up tables, and they sell what they can. And they'll just set it up anywhere. We drive to an area called Vaifa, which is an hour, about uh, three hours away, and you can be driving along this road where there's not a person to be seen, and suddenly there's a person sitting on the side of the road with a table, thinking, well, that's not real good marketing skills because you're not going to get many people. But that's where they sit, 
and they're happy to do that all day long. They sell petrol in Coke bottles, but also in, in, uh, at Bowser's, but uh, they love to uh, sell small amounts of petrol, and uh, lots of people will stop to top up their fuel tanks with this petrol. I don't know why you would, because it's probably not that clean. They sell clothes on the side of the road until a, a, a downpour threatens, and you should see them run around then trying to get all of their clothes undercover. And that's the school cafeteria. So the students are on the right-hand side, the mummers are on the left-hand side with their eskies, and they feed the food through in exchange for a bit of money. This particular school got a little bit tired of it, so they put metal sheeting, um, they screwed that to that palin fencing. But they made one mistake, they left a gap of about that at the bottom. The mummers still sit there and their hands just go underneath. And the children very honestly put the right money in and they, they, they do the exchange that way. It's actually quite neat to watch. You've got to get rid of the rubbish. What better place to put the rubbish than under a no littering sign? It's everywhere, the rubbish. It's, it's something that you've just got to get used to. You've, you drive behind cars and it's amazing what flies out of the car. Not just civilians, but police cars. There are just cans flying out, there's plastic bottles flying out, lots of things flying out. And you just have to grin and bear it. Initially, I got really upset about that. I still get a bit upset because it's just destroying the environment. Um, there's a, a huge amount of rubbish. But then you also need to appreciate they don't have a, a truck that drives past to collect the rubbish every week. So you've got to get rid of your rubbish somehow. Most often they'll burn it, but they'll also just put it in a central dumping spot. And I find it rather ironical that they put it under a no littering sign. Security guards can be seen everywhere. Every major establishment is fenced off with razor wire on top. There are thousands upon thousands of security guards. They walk around with guns. And initially I thought, oh yeah, they're just uh, like plastic guns. No, they are real guns and they're loaded. In fact, at this particular shopping centre, two guards got into an argument and one guard shot the other guard and killed him inside the shops late in the afternoon. It was actually quite a scary incident. We often shop there and quite fortunately it didn't happen whilst we were there. But again, it is that kind of society. Payback is huge in PNG. In the middle of all of that, we have our Bible College. Now, our Bible College has got this as a vision, 20, 30, 30. And what on earth do those numbers mean? Well, we would like to see, that is the Bible College there, 20 pastors, 30 students every year by the year 2030. Now, at the moment, we have 23 students. Five years ago, we had seven, so it's growing. We've graduated 13 students from the diploma course. So we've got seven more students to graduate by 2030 to, to reach our vision. We're very thankful for what's happening there at the Bible College. And so what I'd like to do now is, is step us through this Bible College in a, in a little bit more detail. I'll try to get rid of that slide. That's better. These are five of our students who are now fully qualified pastors. Pastor Isidore on the extreme left, who a lot of you might know something about as working in Kamkumung Church in Leh. He works on the other side of the Owen Stanley Range. Then there's Pastor Nawai and Pastor Isi, who work close to the Bible College. There's Pastor Paul, who works in Vafer. And then on the extreme right-hand side is Pastor Tony, and he works in One Tune. Now, we can add to that list now candidate Pastor David Culper. He's just been passed by classes, and so really we have six pastors. And next year, we have another student who's completed this year, and he hopes to get examined next year by classes 
So that makes seven pastors for the Reformed churches. How amazing is that? Seven pastors who know the language, who can work with the people, and who just wish to spread God's word. Today was an amazing day in Hilla, up in the highlands. 29 people who have joined the church. The church has started there now. We hope and pray that that, that church can be instituted and that one of these men can help that church get to the point of being instituted. Kamkumung is our only instituted church. But it is busy reaching out into its, communi- in, into its community trying to get church plants happening. And I just find it such an exciting thing that's happening there in Papua New Guinea. And again, um, very thankful for what the Bible College can do in, in uh, promoting the work that needs to happen. I don't know why I keep getting that slide. There is the Bible College grounds. Now, let's not spend too much time on stats and numbers, but suffice it to say that we've got a fair amount of acreage there, and we're very thankful for that. And on the right-hand side of that picture, towards the bottom of that yellow box, there's opportunity for us to buy a little bit more land. And we're seriously thinking about that, because history has shown within the reform circles, we never, ever buy enough land, ever. And we always say, if only our forefathers had have had more foresight. And so now we're trying to convince ourselves that we are the people with more foresight and that in 20 to 30 years' time, they'll go, weren't they clever to buy it? So let's run through a day at the Bible College. 6.30 is start time. You should hear the bell soon. It's a very advanced bell. You can hear the birds. That's our bell. And if you don't scratch it first, but just belt it, the students will get really upset with you. You've got to scratch it first. They're all the cabins that the students sleep in. They're the two bunk houses that we built for all the single boys. So at 6.30, they all wake up and it's time to cook breakfast. It's not wheat bix. It's not eggs on toast. It's not wheat bix because they don't have fridges to store milk. They don't have money to buy the wheat bix. We give them food. We give them flour. We give them oil. They mix it together. They make a bit of a bread they uh, fry it up over a wood stove because, again, they don't have their, uh, their gas, gas ovens, etc., etc. Um, it, it kind of does make you feel... You, you really do appreciate what they have to go through, particularly when, in your own house there, you've got all of those things. So you, you kind of sometimes feel, oh, maybe we've got a little bit too much We've got the students just on one side and they see what we've got and it's like, oh. When I first was there, I was like, well, so what? But after a while, it kind of, I don't know, it just makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. Um, That's not to say that I'm going to make a wood fire every morning. Don't get me wrong. They also love frying, frying bananas. So that's a bit of a favourite there. Cooking bananas. The first time we went to the markets, we bought, we bought these bananas. Cheap as. I said, Liz, I can't wait to get home to eat these bananas. We got home, tried to peel them. They were impossible to peel. So when I mentioned it to one of the nationals, he said, ah, they're cooking bananas. You can't peel them. You have to fry them in oil. And if you know my wife, she hates deep frying things. So that's it. No cooking bananas because they really taste great. Um, Here's one of our students rolling out some uh, flour with the water to create that kind of food. So that's their breakfast. And at 8 o'clock, they've all got to be in the classroom to start morning devotions. Hey. 
Morning devotions missed. We missed morning devotions. Can I go back one? Can we get this one to go, Larry? Yeah. Doesn't want to? Okay. Well, you would have heard them singing. Never mind. We'll move on. So this is our certificate. Students busy doing their work. So we we have that morning devotion from 8 o'clock to 8.30. And um, typically we spend about 10 minutes singing. Then one of uh, the ministers or myself will lead devotions to half past eight. And then it's off to class. And so this is the students doing some of their classwork. And this too should be a little video. So if we can click play on that one. It's not liking, is it? Quick time, not available. Doesn't matter. We, we, we can move on. We can improvise. We're in P&G. <laughs> and these are some of the courses that we would go through. So the certificate students are taught every time, every lesson, something about through the word, through the Bible, something about the catechism, something about English. And then along with that, we have these modules. And you can read them for yourself. But the favourite two modules are Christian marriage and family life and parenting. They are the favourites because the people in Papua New Guinea have no idea what scripture says about parenting or Christian marriage. Their eyes become sources as you speak to them about what scripture teaches us what Christian marriage is. For some of them, Christian marriage or marriage is um, I run off with my girlfriend, have sex, come back the next morning and say, we had sex, oh, you're married, bang, 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 go the pots and the pans, a big party, you're married. So that's how some of our students thought marriage was. Others, for other areas, you're not married till you have a child. So if your wife doesn't, or your girlfriend, or whatever you might call her, doesn't produce any children, you grab someone else. And so it is a society which allows for polygamy. Others are married through arranged marriages, where the parents have said, you will marry that person. And it's later on in life that they realise that they're married. So there's a lot of confusion about what marriage is. And then we say, as far as what scripture says about leaving and cleaving, they find that really difficult as well because in all of their marriages, they have a bride price. They've got to pay big money. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the father's, the, the, the bride's, the groom's family's got to pay big money to the uh, bride's family because they're pinching a daughter. And uh, that way she comes across, but then they own her. So last year, we had a student who died from COVID and this widow was owned by this student's, this student's family. And they determined how long she had to mourn. They determined how long she had to wear dark clothing. They determined everything. Um, and it's been a real challenge for her because she's a Christian, but she's trying to respect her, her family. And her family are not Christian. The man that she married was the only Christian out of that whole family. And so he was gone. It was just, it was really, really difficult. But this, this lady has been quite amazing, quite incredible. And you can see some of the other courses there that, uh, that we go through. And I can assure you, I do not teach music. Uh, Pastor Cor Klein teaches music. And when he finally goes, then I have no idea who's going to teach music and I might drop music because there will be a cacophony of sound, but it won't be music. That is one thing for sure. But peacemaking is another really interesting one, and again, quite critical for that society. So that's the certificate course. It's a two-year course. Men and women are most welcome to be part of this course, and if you score really well, an average of 75% in Christian doctrine and the Bible studies course, and an average of above 65% in all the other courses, you're allowed to go to the diploma course. And the diploma course this year had more students than ever before. So these are our diploma students. One of those students did leave us. 
He's the one at the back in the middle, Bussy. He found the going a little bit too difficult. But these students, the diploma students, do a three-year course, and these are some of their courses. And for the ministers in our midst, you'll probably recognise some of those courses. Now, we certainly wouldn't do them to the same degree that our um, brothers uh, are doing it in, in the Canadian seminary, but certainly it is challenging, certainly a lot of work. And these students are up early and they stay up late trying to get their way through all of that work. And so it's a three-year course. We, we think that they end up being well-trained. So we also allow for our diploma students to have laptops. We sell them, sell them to them. We don't give it to them. You never give things to these people. You've got to make sure that they pay something so that they gain ownership over it. Our mission statement, so our vision statement comes from our mission, and our mission is preparing God's people for works of service. So in our preparation, we do a lot of work getting the students ready to, to work in the churches. So that's why we like having women in the certificate course. They can go out and they can become good Sunday school teachers or good leaders for the women's Bible study or just good at organising things within the churches. The men, obviously, would love for them to become pastors, but... We keep saying to them, just because you don't become a pastor, don't see that as a shame factor. A lot of the men there think that if I go into the diploma program, I have to become a pastor. No, you don't have to. You would make a wonderful elder or a wonderful deacon or a, just a wonderful leader within the church. So stick at it. It's really good that you can be part of it. But of course, that's all academic. We also are wanting our students to, to produce works of service in a very physical way. So our students live on the campus 24 hours a day, seven days a week, their whole family. And so the campus, to run, needs their input because we don't charge them a lot of money. It's as well because otherwise they wouldn't come. It would be too expensive. But we do expect them every afternoon to work about an hour and a half, two hours in the garden for the college, not for themselves. And so that's what they do. And here they are, I'm glad this one worked, with their big long bush knives cutting kungo. That's our kungo patch. It's a green leafy vegetable. And we've got to trim it down every now and again. Quite uh, ironically, that kungo patch is fed by a piggery just across the road and uh, as a consequence this kungo grows better than probably anywhere else in Port Moresby. So when these students take the kungo to the markets, everyone knows these are the RCBC students. That kungo is M Suitumas. They love the kungo from the Reformed Churches Bible College. So our students get top dollar for this kungo. But they've got to work hard for it. So here they are picking and that white stuff is just string and of course they've got this real fuzzy hair and they just whack it on the head and it just sticks there. It wouldn't stick on my head. And uh, they just bend over and they pick and pick and pick and they produce hands of kungo and then they go to the markets and they sell those hands and the income that they generate they can keep and we encourage of course that they ought to tithe as well. Yes, quick question. That's after they've got a hand of that uh, kungo, they tie it up, there's one hand, and then they go on to the next. And they all know exactly who's picked how many hands. I tell you, it's quite remarkable. We feed them food every day. Or at the beginning of the week, we give them um, things like oil, tin fish, noodles, sugar and flour and we calculate how much each family needs. I've got this big spreadsheet that does all the calculations. I worked out what the minimum protein requirement was for every person and then upped it a little bit. And Anyway, you play with the figures a little bit and then you end up with a certain amount for each particular family. And on Monday afternoon, they come in and they pick up their food. 
Um, you'll notice that none of that is freezer food. It's all dry food and they need to make sure they store it in such a way that the rats can't get at it as well. Every afternoon, they come to pick up rice. So again, there's a calculation as to how much rice they can get, and so some of the ladies are responsible for distributing that rice. And the students come with their containers, and they pick up their rice, and uh, that's, that's their rice quantity for the day. They often add kungo to their rice, by chopping it up in very fine pieces, and that with tin fish is their meal. And actually, it tastes all right. Both Liz and myself have more than once had um, rice with kungo, but we, we, we get pumpkin tips or pumpkin leaves and chop that up with tin fish and coconut milk. Ladies, it's a good dish. It's all right, I tell you. It's quite all right. And, uh, we, we also quite regularly take the students into our place, but we've learnt real quickly. As soon as you take one in, you've got to take the other 22 in as well, right? So it's a process of time. And we always make sure that we feed them meat because they don't get much meat. They get fish, tin fish, but just good, fresh meat. They don't get much of it. But occasionally they do. A snake. Woe betide any snake that enters the grounds of the RCBC. The students are onto it in next to no time, and here they are skinning one of the pythons. It's good meat and it's fresh. And uh, that snake didn't last long. And they skin it and uh, fry it up or, or boil it up, and, and they consume it. And uh, we, we actually don't mind as, as white skins because that way the snake population stays a little bit low because there are a few dangerous snakes around there. We give all of the students a plot of land. The students, or PNGers, are excellent gardeners. They can grow stuff in concrete, I'm sure of it. It's unbelievable what they can do. And, um, you know, they love growing sweet potato, which is kul kul in, in Tokpisan, and they love growing beans, and they can grow it like nothing else, and uh, they, they get some extra time in the afternoon to look after their gardens. So this food will supplement the food that we give to them, just to make it a bit better, and a lot of them will grow a little bit more so that they can market that food and gain a little bit more income. So we're really pleased about that. They've got to do washing, washing of their clothes. This is Christine. This is the lady who lost her husband. She's got five children. She's got to wash clothes for five children. You don't put it in a washing machine. There is no washing machine. It's done by hand. When Liz and I went village living, we uh, had to do the same. We had to wash by hand. And the first day, it was really neat, down by the river and, you know, Liz is washing and I'm sitting there going, oh, this is, this is pretty neat, eh, Liz? You know? Washing the clothes. On about day two, this is pretty good, isn't it? By the end of the week, I was, oh, yeah, this is all right, I suppose. By the end of the week four, it says, I cannot wait for that blasted washing machine. I'm over washing by hand, I tell you. These people do it all the time. And, and they are very, very resilient people. I guess they don't know any better, but in a way they do. Because they see us. They see us using washing machines, but they do it and uh, we do supply them with uh, the facilities. They've got to buy their own soap. We do say, you buy your own soap uh, to, to wash your clothes. Now, all work and no play makes Johnny a dull boy. We do give them time to play as well. They love their volleyball, and they love rugby league. Now, I haven't got any photos of the rugby league, but certainly the volleyball, they're very good at that. It's not only volleyball that they play, there's also time to story. p and love storying. So in the afternoons, I walk around the various cabins and I've got to sit down and story. Now, you can't just talk about the weather because the weather's always the same. So you've got to talk about all kinds of things and it's sometimes really hard. 
How many times do I have to tell them that I've got two children and one lives in Canada and one lives in Perth and one's got three children and one's not got any children? And so it's, a, it's hard work, I think it is. But for them, it's really easy work. They just are natural storytellers and they just sit down and they story, they talk. And they just love that because they are relationship-driven people. We can be very time-oriented and we've got to get from point A to point B and, hi, how are you going? And keep walking on. They don't do that over there. If it's, hi, how are you going? You stop and say, hi, how are you going? To the ridiculous degree where I was following someone in the car and the car was coming the other way. They both knew each other. They both stopped. In the, so one's coming this way. I'm, he's going that way. They stopped and spoke to each other. There was a line up behind him and a line up behind them. Waited for the conversation to get, finish and then we kept going again. I thought, that's a relationship way too far. Come on. <laughs> and they've got time for family. So here's James. He's entering his final year next year of the diploma program with his son, Cornelius, named after Reverend Cornelius Klein. And uh, it's a real honour to be... To, to have a namesake, but it, it, it can work against you as well. Because um, if something goes wrong, it's like Reverend Klein, your namesake, something's gone wrong and we need a bit of money. And you kind of feel compelled to have to give a little bit to help. Um, Liz has got a namesake, but that's a white skin, so we, don't, we, we can ignore that. I've got two half namesakes, so I figure I only have to give half. <laughs> But he's a really nice guy and, and he, he wouldn't do that anyway. He's, he's a great guy. At night, all the students need to go back to the classroom. So from half past four till, half, till eight o'clock, they have free. They, of course, need to prepare their dinner. They need to light the fires and get their dinner ready. They need to have their showers and all the rest of it. Eight o'clock, back into the classroom. Most students are back in the classroom before 8 o'clock. And they finish at about 9, quarter past 9. Most students will stay later than that because they're coming from a background where they actually have not had a real good education. You know, you and I have pretty much had access to Year 12 education if we wanted it. A lot of these people here they have had education up to grade six or seven at best. Some of our students to grade three. And then their parents have said, listen, I need help in the garden, away from school into the garden. So a lot of them, their education levels are low. And so they're playing catch up. And man, do they work hard in trying to catch up. And, and this is Jeffrey, and there's a few other students there just really trying to wrap his head around the stuff that they covered during the course of the day. And I really appreciate that with our students. This is a games night on Fridays. Friday nights is games night.
So we, we on Friday nights, we have this fellowship. It's, it's time to, to unwind for the week and enjoy each other's company. So we do different things. We have games nights, we, we have these board games nights, we have fellowship nights where we split all of the students up into three groups and uh, one group will come to our place, one group will go to the Kleins, one group will go to the Vartstras and we story, we sing songs, we, we just, just enjoy each other's company and it's, it's really enjoyable, really nice and it's good for the students to see another side of us and it's good for us to see another side of them and uh, it, it's, it's really neat. Sometimes we take them down to uh, Ella Beach, we put them into the back of the ute and we all drive to Ella Beach which is about half an hour away. Um, it's beautiful beautiful facilities there, play basketball, play volleyball, some people walk along the beach. Again, just get them out of, the, out of the environment in which they're in. And of course, by the end of the week, um, people are pretty tired. So here's one of the, uh, the children of the, the students, totally exhausted. Um, it often strikes me, we will make sure that our children go to bed on time, about seven, eight o'clock at night, um, these people don't think that way and children will stay up as late as parents will stay up and you know so if you have events that last till 10 o'clock 11 o'clock at night these young kids will stay up till they crash and they will crash anywhere and so on the hall suddenly there's just this body lying there fast asleep and you've got to step over that one and there's another one standing over there or sleeping over there um, it's it's quite something I'll tell you quite something. And so that's a day at the college. And I want to finish by speaking about two people, two students, Vicky Baboro and the other student is Corny Pantas. Vicky Baboro is a member of the Reformed Church at Beretete. So she's a good hour and a half away from the college, well outside of Port Moresby, in a small village. Vicky stopped her education at grade three. Vicky does not understand English. I have to teach in English. That's a government requirement. It's the official language in Papua New Guinea, English. So when she applied to come to the college, my instinct was no, well, look, she, you don't meet the requirements. But I was encouraged by the national pastors to please let her come in. Her pastor, Pastor Nawai, said, look, she's really keen. Please, can she just sit there? Can she just, in a sense, through a process of diffusion, osmosis, call it what you like, um, get something from what the Reformed Church's Bible College might offer and also that she can just meet other people? Anyway... A bit of toing and froing, and I relented, and uh, she came in. Well, I've been teaching for 30 years. This lady is my favourite student ever. She is, was amazing. She's, she's finished. She didn't pass. That was expected. But this lady taught all of us what it, what it really means to be a Christian. You know, so often we can be consumed with this idea that we've got to get things, we've got to get a qualification, we've got to get this, we've got to get that. And for this lady, it just didn't matter. None of that mattered. What mattered for her was applying her faith to everyday situations. You know, love, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control, all of those things. She, she had every reason to just throw her hands up in frustration and say, I've had enough, I'm out of here. She just had this gracious smile every day. It just... She humbled me over and over again. There was a student, at the end of the year, we have this we have this thing where staff and students all get together and we, we enjoy coffee and cake and then we debrief and students will stand up and they'll talk about the year and they'll say, oh, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful occasion. They, they talk about all the things they've done wrong. 
And they say, oh, can you please forgive me for, for being so bad to you in the gardens in this time and I'm sorry about this and there's lots of tears that are shed. One of our students who graduated from the diploma program this year, one of our very intelligent students, very gifted, Nick, he was in his first year in the certificate course when Vicky graduated from the certificate course. And Nick stood up and he said, you know, when I started this year, I looked around the class and I thought, who is going to be the competition for me? When I saw Vicky, I realised I didn't have to worry about her. This is, he just says it really openly. And he said, but I soon realised that Vicky was teaching me things. When it came time for gardening, Vicky was always the first one there. And she worked harder than any of us. Vicky was always patient. Vicky was always kind. And finally, he says, you know, Vicky, you taught me more than what the lecturers taught me. You taught me what it was to be a Christian. And he's just got these tears running down his face. And he comes up to Vicky and gives her a big hug. Big hug. Let's go. And then, and then Vicky just very quietly says, it's okay, Nick. And it's just like, oh, don't do this to me. It was just the most beautiful thing ever. And that's, that's our Vicky. Very poor education. But wow, she knew and knows what it is to be a Christian. And you go up to Beretete now, and the service finishes, the first service, and the students have to go off for Sunday school. And, and my heart kind of just goes, wow, because up stands Vicky and leads all these kids out. It's just like, yes, she's got it. And she's contributing in a really big, powerful and meaningful way to this church with grade three education. I was humbled. And now when a student says, can I join and I'm a member of the Reformed Churches of PNG, come right on in. You're very, very welcome. So that's Vicky, one end of the scale. Corny Pantas, right at the other end, he's got a degree, a degree in teaching. He's probably the most intelligent student we've ever had. But he had a real rough start. He spent 13 years in jail for a very serious crime. He said, Mr Mark, you can tell everybody that I've been in jail for 13 years, but please don't talk about what it was that put me into jail. And I will respect that and I will please ask that you don't ask questions as to what it was that put him into jail. But he spent 13 years in jail. Whilst in jail, he was exposed to Crossroads Bible Ministry and it turned him. The spirit was at work and he became a Christian. And you should see this man's Bible it is like no other Bible I've ever seen. It's got highlighter marks everywhere. It's got pen marks everywhere. And the Bible doesn't shut properly like a Bible. Because it's been so well used and because it's so humid, the whole thing is just opened up completely. It's like the big, big round thing of all these individual sheets of paper. It's the most beautiful Bible. I said, Courtney, don't you ever lose that Bible. It is wonderful. It is so powerful. And when I picked him up from the airport, see, he, lit, he was in Alital, and the director of Crossroads Bible Ministry from Australia had contact with Reverend Cor Klein. And he said, look, we've got this guy who's going to leave the prison. And they don't have this, this program in, in Papua New Guinea where he can kind of um, go to a halfway house. They just... Kick him out and off you go. Look after yourself. And he, this, this guy said to, to Cor, really worry about him. He's really gifted. He loves God's word. Do you think that the Bible college could, could take him? Anyway, again, our gut reaction was, well, we're not a rehabilitation centre. But we spoke about it more and more, spoke about it with the national pastors. We, we make sure we 
always speak to our national pastors about who can come in and who can't. And they too encourage us, give them a try, give them a go. Well, Corny came, and so I had to pick him up from the airport, and as we're driving home, this is his, pretty much his second day of freedom. I said, Corny, it must be really strange now, you're free. At the next set of lights that are stopped, you can open that door, you can walk out if you wanted to. And he says, Mark, I was free seven years ago. He said, that's when Christ found me. That's when I turned to Christ. I was free then. Yeah, I was contained within four walls, but I was finally free. But wow, this guy has got depth to his thinking like nothing else. And he's gone through the program, and it's just been a, a, an amazing sequence of events. We fast-tracked him through the certificate program. If we had kept him there for two years, I think he probably would have looked for another Bible college. So we said to him, as we got to the end of the first year, listen, it's very obvious that you know your stuff. You want to go straight into the diploma program. Well, that couldn't happen fast enough for him. And so he got into the diploma program. He's performed really, really, really well. And he's graduated this year. And we're hoping that next year he can uh, go through classes and become a minister within our churches because that's the other remarkable thing about Corny. Corny came to the Bible College not as a member of the Reformed Churches of Papua New Guinea. He came basically as an individual. But through the process of time, he asked to be admitted to the church as a member of the Reformed Churches, Bible Co of, the, uh, Reformed Churches of Papua New Guinea. And with examination, he was accepted as a member. It was a beautiful event. And then he said, oh, you know, my wife and children are still in Alital. Would they be able to come to the Bible College as well? I said, of course, that would be wonderful. Your family could be together. He said, you know, it's not about my family being together. What I've done wrong is wrong. And my wife has every reason why she should not be with me. I said, so, so wh wh why do you want them here? He said, because then they get exposed to the Reformed faith. Then they too may commit themselves to the Reformed religion. This guy gets it. What's the most important thing in life? And through the grace of God, this year, or towards the end of last year, his wife Yolme came and one of their daughters. Halfway this year, another daughter came. And just before we left to go to Cairns for our, our conference, his final daughter came. His family is complete. And he's so happy. Not because he's, it's for him, but he says they are now constantly being exposed to the reform doctrine. And it's his prayer, it's his hope that they will all become members of the Reformed Churches of Papua New Guinea. And so we're really thankful for him. And so we've got Vicky on one side, grade three education, but understood exactly what it was to be a Christian. We have this man on the other side, a degree, but he throw, he's busy throwing his life away, goes into jail, his life changes, and then he understands what it is that needs to change in his life and how things need to all come together. And we have this whole range of students in between that uh, are between Corny and Vicky, basically. And so for Liz and myself, it's just this, this an amazing journey that we've been on um, dealing with these people. It's a real privilege to, to be exposed to their lives and, and, and sharing with them our life. And that's also why when we went there, we made a decision. We made a decision to get rid of everything. Because we wanted the students and the people in Papua New Guinea to know that we couldn't leave them at the drop of a hat. Because relationships are so important for them. So we got rid of everything, and it was like we were standing on this edge of a cliff, and we said, Lord, you're going to have to hold us. And we, we stepped off. 
And he just, he did. He always does. And he just put us very gently in Port Moresby and he's just continued to guide us for the five and a bit years, expose us to, to lots of challenges. But you know what? Every challenge, every challenge, and you confronted with them too, every challenge is an opportunity to grow in faith. And so God has been very good to Liz, very good to me. And we are, are really enjoying that work that we're allowed to do. Um, and it's our hope, it's our prayer that the Bible College can continue to, to put out students, not just at the certificate level, but particularly at the diploma level, so that churches like Hiller, the new church at Hiller, can have a minister. And so other church plants that we're hoping to, to set up throughout Port Moresby can all have their own national pastor and that they can be led by these, these national men and that the reformed faith, that that footprint can grow and grow and grow and so that people there can understand what it is to, to believe in God and to apply that belief to your everyday walk of life. And I think that's probably enough talking from me. Thank you. So that was just under an hour. So we've got some time for questions, if, if you've got any. Yes. The, uh, the reformed churches of Papua New Guinea, we used to think the way of Port Moresby as separate things. Are they coming together more? What's the future? Excellent. Thank you for that question. They were separate things because at the time, Armadale was taking care of lay and made it very clear, we only will take care of lay. So Toronto, which is our sending church, said, well, we'll take care of Port Moresby. And New Zealand came in and helped Toronto. But there was always that divide, the Owen Stanley range, but it was just a physical divide and it really shouldn't have been a divide between all three boards. And so we've managed to get all three boards on the same page now and now the Southern River Mission Board has said that their mission field is all of P&G, basically. So they're incorporating Port Moresby as well. And in fact, we're ever so thankful that the Southern River Mission Board is now busy looking for a missionary to work at the Bible College, but not as a lecturer, but as a missionary helping the national pastors and hoping to establish another church plant. So we see now that all of PNG is working together as one entity. So we're, we share reports with, the, with, our, with our fellow colleagues in Lay, or they now in, are in Ukurumpa. Um, so we share reports with them about the work that's happening in our churches, and they share reports that's happening in their churches, you know, um, Kamkumung, Hila, and, and uh, Wantun. Yes, follow on. Sorry. Yeah. If you do mission news or if someone else does that, can you put a, a, just a simple map of Port Moresby and telling us where all the plants are, not the Port of New Guinea, so that we know where to find them? Yes. I've found some of them on, on Google Maps. It's a bit hard. Yep. Certainly will. Thank you for that advice. Most definitely. Um, consider it done for the next one. Uh-oh, can you remind me? <laughs> yes. That's certainly what we would love for them to do. So we have uh, Reverend Ryan de Jong. He went to Lai and he helped Kamkumung become a, a instituted church. Then he left Kamkumung. He didn't stay there. Because imagine, he stays there and the national pastor is there. The national pastor is always going to look up to the white-skinned pastor. Right? I hope you don't mind that I, I use that. Well, I'm very used to using white skin, but uh, uh, an expat pastor. right? He, or, he will look up to him always. And in a sense, inhibit his work. Make that work hard. So Reverend Ryan de Jong said, I need to move away, went to Ukurumpa. 
so that this man can initially struggle but now flower, become strong. They did some work, so David Pohl is there as well, Reverend David Pohl's doing work in Hila. Now there's a group big enough for them to have this wonderful day today where in a sense it's a formalised church plant. It's not an instituted church, it's a formalised church plant. So this church can now grow, which means that now we're looking for other areas to have a church plant, to start a church. And we do that by, by market preaching. So they'll go out and they'll preach God's word. And in Port Moresby or in, in Lay or, in, or anywhere in PNG, I can stand on the corner of the street and if I start talking about God's word, people will stop, they'll take their hats off and they'll listen. And if at the end you say, right, let's pray, then certainly all the men take their hats off and they're silence and they listen. And they'll come up to you and they'll ask questions. I've seen people trying to do it here. Everyone just walks past them like they don't exist. Right? Because everyone's time-oriented. Everyone's got to go somewhere else and they've got no time to listen to the gospel, which is a real shame. So that's a real advantage for PNG. They stop. They listen. And what we've had is contact. So they do that preaching and a person comes and listens and then says, I've got a whole heap of people at this place that needs to hear more of that. Can you come? So the minister would follow. Got this beautiful story about one man who now works for us at the Bible College who was impacted by market preaching. Upper Moses is his name. So Reverend Ian Wilderbore. Do you know Reverend Ian Wilderbore? I'm sure we all do. He uh, was doing preaching and Upper Moses was totally convinced by what he heard. And he said, oh, I, I want to know more about this. So Ian says to him, you've got to go to the Bible College. But to go to the Bible College, you've got to go to Lay. You've got to be interviewed by Pastor Isidore and he'll say yes or no. So he goes all the way to Lay from the Highlands. 60 kina it cost him. That's more than what he earns in a week to get to Lay, only to be told by Pastor Isidore, you're not good enough to go to the Bible College. And often, that's the end of the story. The man disappears. Upper didn't disappear. He stayed at Lay, and he worked hard and studied and uh, just acquainted himself with God's word and then got in contact with Pastor Ian and Pastor Ian said, try again. So he went back to Pastor Isidore, tried again and Pastor Isidore said, you know what, you actually have learned a fair bit and you've shown and proven yourself. So go to the Bible college. Well, this guy was a bit like Vicky, not highly intelligent, but boy, what a guy. And we love him now as a campus worker. And he's got one of these beautiful stories, which I can keep going on with, about Christian marriage and family life. He actually is the man who got remarried in the church because he had a, one of these marriages where you just run off, right? And then come back. And he said, oh, that was all wrong. Can I somehow get married properly? So we saw that as a great opportunity to teach about marriage. So he got married in front of the church with all the exchange of vows. And then we said, now you can kiss the bride. Now, you don't show public affection in PNG culture. But we thought, this is really important to do. And Upper kissed the bride and the church roared. They thought it was the best thing ever. But we, we've got this couple who are officially married in a, in a very church way. Um, so that's a long story, but market preaching is our way of getting new church plants. Great question, thank you. Yes. Thank you. We are trying our best to do ourselves out of a job. Yes. The sooner we can do that, the better. Most definitely. Next year, no, 2024, my hope is, and I've spoken to some of the national pastors, that they 
um, get involved in the certificate course, start teaching in the certificate program. For them to teach in the diploma program, they really ought to have a qualification, one qualification level higher than the actual diploma program. So we're thinking of ways of having our, some of our existing national pastors getting a degree so that they can teach. So we think that we can actually get a number of national pastors to do all the teaching. Our biggest challenge will be getting nationals to manage the finances. That's going to be the hard one. It's really hard for them to get their head around the numbers and the numbers are so great that the college is not self-sustaining. We are dependent on overseas funding. And when they see that money, it's very tempting for some of that money to just find its way elsewhere in, in all kinds of different ways. And, and that's going to be really difficult for them. So it'll, t it'll take a while. That's certainly what we're trying to do. Our staffing arrangement right now is satisfactory. We can handle 30 students every year. We'll, we, we, we should be able to handle that, yes. Thanks. Any more? Yes. Sorry? I think we're gaining people in the church. We're gaining. When we first got there, it was kind of a new person would come and then and one person just wasn't turning up anymore. So the overall numbers was about the same. But if I look at the church that I attend, Nine Mile Church, certainly the numbers have just gone right up and uh, we're, we're thinking of expanding the church. And the, the, the beautiful thing about Nine Mile Church is that the growth is in the youth, in the youngsters. And it's the youth which are the future of the church. And we're so happy with that. The biggest struggle that we have in the Reformed churches of Papua New Guinea is that we have, this might sound funny, we've got too many women. We don't have enough men. You see, a lot of the women that came to church came to church because they were being abused. Church was a safe sanctuary and then they kind of got into the gospel and became members. But their husbands didn't. And their husbands tolerate them going to church, but they, their husbands don't come to church. So we have lots and lots of women. But a church to be instituted needs men for leadership, for the elders, for the deacons, for our ministers. And so we're hoping and praying that more men come and join the churches. That's, that's the big area for us, and that's why we're excited when we see lots of youth at the church. And so we're very busy on Saturdays running youth programs to keep them busy, keep them involved, so that uh, they don't wander off. Great question. Yes? So we would have, at the moment, for example, we've got this, uh, all of our pastors that have graduated have a church that they're busy pastoring in. So here, at the moment, there would be no man that's available other than candidate pastor David Culper. So he's entered the program and he's going to be working with Pastor Isidore, so two nationals working together, Pastor Isidore giving skills to candidate pastor David Culper. It's like a vicariate in, the, in, in some of our uh, other church systems. And so I think what might happen is that in time, David Culper might well find himself called to Hila. So what we do is we, we try to train the congregation about 
the whole calling process and the, the whole, the whole um, thing of supporting your pastor. So if you want a pastor, you need to, you need to call a pastor. And, you know, if you're a Reformed church, you need to call these from this pool of men. But only call if you are prepared to support. And if you're prepared to support, how much money are you prepared to give? Are you prepared to build a home? Are you prepared to donate some land? Are you prepared? And they've got to sign off on all of those points. Because otherwise there's no commitment. You can't hold them to anything. And so in that way, we get those, those men coming into the system trained by the Bible College, then getting practice in an, ex in an established church, then moving on. Does that help? Yeah, well, so, yes, so we're hoping, like I said, in 2024, that um, we can get some of the national pastors to come down to the Bible College for a, a block of teaching. So we're asking already now, um, approaching the consistory and saying, listen, you know, in a year's time, would you be prepared to let go of your minister for a four or five week block so that they can teach at the Bible College? And the feedback is positive. So that's good. Yes. Yes. What does the theological educational landscape in Port Moresby look like? Um, there are others. Uh, I think there's one called Divine Word out at Waigani. Um, so people do go there. Um, we have had a look at their program. It's not quite as rigorous, so a lot of people like to go there. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges that we're confronted with is that our pastors... For a man to become a pastor in the Reformed Churches of Papua New Guinea, it takes five years. Now, we think that that's fairly normal and, and it should take a long time. You, you need to immerse yourself into scripture. Um, most of these other colleges are pumping out pastors every six months. And so we're ending up with men on the street who pretend to be pastors, who wish to start their own church, but their knowledge of scripture is pretty poor. In fact... I had a student who wanted to apply as a member, as a student at the Bible College, and because he was not a member of the Reformed Churches of Papua New Guinea, I interviewed him. And I asked him some pretty straightforward Bible questions. And he had gone to a Bible College in Port Moresby. And so I said, oh, can you tell me something about Moses? He looked at me like I had asked him the most difficult question in the world. He had no idea who Moses was. Well, okay, can you, can you mention one of the Gospels? Peter? So, again, no idea. So you, you realise very quickly that knowledge is not very high on their agenda, unfortunately. I don't know exactly what they're driving, but they do pump out people every six months. And now there is a more established college up in the Highlands, um, in Bants, the Christian College of the CLTC. I forget exactly what the, what the letters stand for. That's got a bit more rigour to it, um, but that's a long way away from Port Moresby. So within Port Moresby, I think there's about three others. Would you say that yours is the highest calibre? That's the, yes. That's the feedback that we have received from a number of other churches who have said... Uh, we have a, we're building a relationship with a, with a uniting reformed church, which has got nothing to do with the URC in America. Um, um, and, and those church leaders now are saying, we want to send all of our students to the Bible College and not to any other college in Port Moresby or the CLTC up in, the, in Bants. Not because we're necessarily the cheapest, but because, as they say... Um, your, your, um, your, your level of knowledge that you're imparting to the students is way higher than anywhere else. So a lot of the other colleges do not do those kinds of courses that we're doing in the diploma. So 
Um, we're very thankful for the work that uh, Pastor Henry Versteich did and Pastor Alan Dalma. They set up the diploma course and it's really proven itself. It's been, it's been a real blessing. May I ask just one question? Of course. How common is it for a PNG national pastor to get theological training outside of PNG? Like say an Australian seminary or maybe in North America? I haven't heard of any. I haven't heard of any. It might happen. A lot of them would struggle to get a passport because a lot of them have no idea when they were born. They have no paperwork, so they just wouldn't get a passport. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, I, I've not heard of any. You mentioned it before that um, if you're hoping to set up a theological degree, that you're also hoping that the locals will have a university degree. Mm. Not very high at all. Not very high at all. Most, um, mo most people leave school by the end of grade six or seven. So the, the rate of, of students completing year 12 is very low. And then from there into university is obviously even lower. It's money, but it's also just, it's just convenience for parents to have them working in the gardens. He just, he, he's been blessed with um, a lot of ability and his parents um, were rich enough to send him through. So there was a money factor. But he also comes from an area of, of, of uh, P&G where they value education more highly. See, Port Moresby, you need to understand, is, is, is um, just got thousands upon thousands of people who have, who have just descended upon the city from the highlands, because Port Moresby is the capital. That's where the money is. They come screaming down. They've got no home, and they don't have a job. So guess what established? Settlements. They live in a tin shed with tarpaulins and cardboard because that's all they can afford. If, in fact, they don't have to afford anything. They just plonk themselves there, and then someone plonks themselves there and there and there, and that's how they live. And it's, it's terrible. They would have been better staying up in the highlands. But they've come down, so there's thousands of these people who are living in settlements with nothing, absolutely nothing. Whereas in areas like Alatau, like Kokopo and Medang and, and those areas, um, there's, there's better food, better money, better education. Port Moresby, very, very low. Very low. Yes, my primary role is teaching. I am very fortunate that I don't have to divide myself in the, into ministry and teaching. I can just focus on teaching and, and administration. So our other two ministers, Pastor Kaur and Pastor Hans, Hans Vartstra, they teach in the diploma program. I reduce their teaching load and then they can also work in the churches supporting the ministers. Um, my role then is just teaching and administration. Liz's role is with um, the library. Liz's role is with our Christian bookstore. We've just started a Christian bookstore because there's no Christian bookstores in Port Moresby. So we're hoping that everyone comes to the Bible College to buy their books. And uh, she actually just acts as a bit of a mentor for a lot of the wives of the students as well. So they often come around and uh, they've also realised that Liz is a pretty good cook so they get her to bake a birthday cake when they think it might be their birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you'll be surprised. On, on Facebook I noticed that one person's got about four birthdays <laughs> every time he opens up a new page. <laughs> they, it's, 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 it's really quite funny. When were you born? Um, September? When the mangoes were ripe? <laughs> it doesn't mean much to them.
Yes, they've got to go to school. So one of the requirements we have when a family comes is that school-aged children need to go to school. There's a public school just down the road and we urge them to enrol there. But here's the problem. The public school is overcrowded. So class sizes, 60 students. Students are sitting on the veranda looking in through the window Technology, non-existent. It's a blackboard with chalk. Books and stationery, you need to buy it yourself. It's free education, but you need to pay money for excursion, you need to pay money for a uniform, you need to pay money for stationery, you need to... Anyway, the list of money keeps going, right? And then students come back to the college early in the morning. I say, how come you're back at the college? You should be at school. Oh, yeah, well, the teacher didn't turn up. Oh, great. So you go to the school. Why isn't this teacher turning up? Yeah, well, you know, he hasn't been paid for a month. And he's sick, and sick to death of not being paid, so he's decided to go home and start a garden for himself. So these kids are going, well, no teacher, no school. Back to, back to the college we go. Bounce around on the trampoline. Good fun. So that's... That's, the education system is shot to smithereens. It's really sad. We've started our own school at Nine Mile, but we can't run it for nothing. It's 500 keener. It's out of reach for a lot of students, so we're a lot of, of our students, so we're thinking of inventive ways of how to support them so that they can send their kids through, but then they've got to get there with the PMV, with the bus. That costs two keener there, two keener back. That's four keener every day. Times five, that's 20 keener. Times two kid, that's 40 keener. And they might earn 30 keener in a week. So they're short. So Liz takes them every morning. Uh, we've agreed not to pick them up because otherwise they just become dependent. And there's a great book called We're Helping Hurts. And there's another book called Toxic Charity. You know, our inclination is just to help, 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 help. But one day we'll be out of the system. And then they sink. So we've got to not let them sink, but just every now and again give them a little bit of air and then let them go again. And it's, it's a real hard act. But yeah, so those kids have to go to school. Short answer. Yes? A keener. A keener. I, I, Let's put it the other way. One dollar, Australian dollar, is two keen of 40. Two keen of 40. Yeah, so it's about, what, 40 odd cents or something? Do my maths right? But what's a day's wage then? The, uh, look, a day's wage is about uh, 30 keener, but our students don't have opportunity to earn much more than 30 keener in a whole week, because they're not going to pick 30 hands of Kungo. That's pretty hard. And then they've got to sell it. So they, they don't really get that opportunity to do that. Um, but our security guards get paid. They work from 6 in the morning to 6 at night, and they get paid, I think it's 40 keener for a day. It's not much. Not much at all. But they seem to be happy. Yes? You said there was um, government regulation that said you had to teach in English. Yes. Is there a lot of government regulation? Is there any government support? No government support, minimal government regulation. Um, we, it's, it is, it's easier for us to speak in English, obviously, to teach in English. I, I certainly switch to pidgin when the discussion becomes a bit more intense and, that, and, and we, you, know, you need to explain it a little bit deeper. Um, the, the, the government plays, a very, plays no role within the, within the, the Bible College itself. Um, so we're, we're very free in that sense. Um, and in fact, government regulations full stop in anything uh, are very are, are minimal, nothing. Um, it's, there's a sense of, of freedom about that, but there's also a sense of, I hope we're doing the right thing, and you just don't know.
anymore. Those are the most questions I've ever had. That's fantastic. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That's it, eh? Good. Got the wrap up. Yep. Done well. Thank you. I'll get this out of your pocket. Yeah, you do that. Make, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you should go to PNG. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mark. That was most appreciated. Um, we have got the kettle on at the back for a coffee afterwards, but before we do, how about I lead you in a prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come before you again. We thank you that we've had an hour and a bit together that we could learn about the work that's happening in Papua, Papua New Guinea, uh, the, the mission work and the work in particular that the Reformed Church's Bible College is, is doing and how also this work is um, working from the basis that, that uh, your people, um, the locals in that area, uh, are trained so that they can also um, spread the gospel to their fellow countrymen. And we know that uh, this, this method is so effective because um, the relationships that they have together are so unique and we, we thank you that this uh, program is on the, on the go and we pray that um, also the, the support that we can give as, as churches here in the West that we also can uh, provide funds so that this important work can continue and also uh, tonight we've, we've gained a, a good insight into to what happens and it gives us um, a connection, it gives us um, also a relationship with those, with those students and, and with the lecturers and, and the staff at, the, at this college. We thank you uh, for the opportunity that we had tonight and we pray that you will bless us also in, this, in the week ahead now um, as we complete the year's activities and we pray also that tonight you will give us a good night's rest so that tomorrow we can take up our task again in your kingdom, wherever you have placed us. We ask you this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.